them in. You can go ahead and be seated. I want to open us, open us up in a word of prayer. And so let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we do praise you. And we do say with one accord that we're here to worship you. And it is well with our soul. Come what may. Come the trials of this day. Come uh, the, the negative emotions that we may face. Come whatever uh, that you have for us this day. We're committing right now as a group of men in this moment to say it is well. It is well with my soul because the world through your death, Jesus, has been crucified to us and us to this world. So what can hold us back? This day is all about you. So come and get your glory in the next few moments as we share time together in your word. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Morning, man. My name is Peyton Coker. So good to be with you. Grateful for our, our pastor, Pastor Neil, Pastor Sean. Grateful for the opportunity to share in God's word. We're in Philippians chapter 1 today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. Philippians chapter 1. We'll be continuing our series through this book that is just dripping with joy. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18 is what we'll be today. And we're ending the summer, and summer growing up in the Coker household was always the time of road trips. Like this is where uh, in the summer we would either go to the mountains or to the beach. Like we adopted this place in, uh, in Orange Beach, Alabama, where I affectionately call it the Redneck Riviera. Like this was the place where we went, the Coker family, we, uh, some of us are missing teeth, we're from Louisiana, uh, we're LSU fans, we roll up and we, we just take over, baby. Like the, the, like the beach club, we changed it to the Redneck Riviera come uh, about this time every year. But before we could get there, we always had to go through about a 9 to 10 to 12 hour drive. And then road trips were a, were, were a struggle. Like vacation, man, it was glorious. We loved the beach, loved being with our family, loved being with our friends. But the road trips, man, they were a test. Like sitting in the car as a young kid, long before iPads came out, like I was, I was uh, kind of right on that, uh, that last little edge where we had those VCRs that were kind of connected to the driver's seat that kind of hung down, and then you had to play on this little screen like this, and dads in the room that have uh, kids about my age, y'all know what I'm talking about, that road trips, they're a test of patience, of patience, of long suffering as you're eagerly awaiting your destination, moving ever so slowly, and I think... Uh, I think as much as I was feeling that as a small child, I think my dad felt it 10 times more because we were pestering. My, my little brother and I, we, we were pestering with questions. Dad, where are we going? Like, like do you even know where, where you're taking us? Do you know how to get there? And then here's the question that I think many of us asked as kiddos. Are we there yet? <laughs> Are we there yet? These two questions, they pester whoever's in the driver's seat, typically our dads. Many of you, you've received these questions as you're taking your family to uh, whatever, whatever destination that you go to on your road trips. And I think these two questions are questions that many of us are asking ourselves spiritually. And maybe in a moment of honesty, as we examine our own spiritual lives, we're asking these two questions to God. That maybe some men came in this room today and you're walking through a trial. And you're looking up in your own time alone with God in moments of stress and you're saying, God, where are you going? Like, where are you taking me? Do you even know the direction that we're headed? Maybe you're here this, this day and you're stagnant in your life and faith. Made no movement. No movement in your life. You haven't grown in maturity. You haven't done anything of significance in quite some time, and you're just in a rut. What are you doing, God? And the other person in this room, and it should be the rest of us if we don't fit those first two questions. The rest of us need this message this morning from God's word to examine our own motives. Because sometimes we look at God who's in the driver's seat, and we have the audacity to say, are we there yet? Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Paul's going to tell us that the gospel is advancing. The gospel is advancing. This is a simple term to say it is moving 
forward. Man, I love our church. I love our series that we just went through s- several months ago uh, called Forward. Well, you don't have to worry about what we're doing as a church, man. We are moving forward. Like the gospel is going to go forward. Where are we going? You turn to our pastor Graham. He's saying we're going forward. What that means is we're going to lost people with the gospel in hand, ready to serve in whatever way. And so Paul is echoing the same thing here that the gospel, man, it moves forward. And we're going to see three things this morning. The gospel moves forward despite persecution, regardless of motivation, and with joy. The gospel moves forward. Paul, he has gone through the pleasantries of the first 11 verses of this letter to this church that he loved. He loves. This church that supported him while he was in chains in Rome and He's writing and he's getting through the Thanksgiving. He's getting through the pleasantries. He's kind of he's at that point where uh, maybe you've been in a business lunch recently or maybe you've eaten lunch with a minister on staff where we kind of get through the, the chit-chat. We've taken you to Chewy's. We've gone to a restaurant. And we kind of turn the corner, right, and we've stopped, stopped talking about who you're drafting on fantasy football, uh, what, you're, what you're doing this weekend, and we start talking about what's really going on in our life. This is where Paul, he, he takes the turn. He shifts from just the joy and the thanksgiving, and he, he answers the question that, they know, that he knows that they are asking. He knows the church at Philippi has heard that he is in prison in Rome. Word had gotten out. Like it has gone viral on social media that he is in prison. And so they're wondering, this church that loves him, how, how's Paul doing? Like how's this man doing? And this is a question, this is a, an instinct of all uh, goodwill believers that we, we just ask genuinely. Man, you see another brother in a trial? Man, how are you doing? Not just some like superficial way where you slap on a smile and you say, man, I'm good. But this truly is a deep question. Paul, he knows that the church at Philippi is asking. So he answers like this in verses 12 through 14. He says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters... That what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord for my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. Paul, he says, what has happened to me? Here's, Here's Paul's current situation. He's in prison in Rome. He landed here because he's at a, he was one of the original victims of lawfare. Like these Jewish prosecutors uh, that, that knew the law, so to speak, trumped up some charges against him so that they could try to, uh, try to quench the movement of God that he was uh, helping lead. He was awaiting trial before Nero. And Acts chapter 28 tells us that he was subsidizing his imprisonment. Like, could you imagine in America today, if we required for every person that is in prison today to subsidize their imprisonment? This is exactly what Paul is going through. He wasn't allowed to leave his house, leave where he was. He, had, he couldn't earn, uh, earn a wage to pay for his change, so he relied upon churches like the church at Philippi for financial support. And here he is waiting his trial for two years, and notice, notice Paul's attitude. Paul's attitude is not that of a victim, someone who would grumble, someone who would complain or whine, someone who would sulk, someone who would doubt God, giving up faith, and at the end of the day say, Lord, I'm retiring, I'm out, it's not worth it. No, 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 that ain't Paul. He says, what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel. My dad raised me to know two things that I can control, my attitude and my work ethic. And Paul, he's controlling his attitude. His chains weren't going to change his attitude. He's not grumbling. He's thanksgiving. He's not complaining. He's rejoicing. He's not doubting. He is growing in confidence because his hard times is igniting boldness within him. It's advancing the gospel. Though he can't go anywhere, the gospel is going everywhere. Paul may be uh, restricted to a small room, but the gospel is not. It is going everywhere. And this is what I love. This is a common rhythm in the scriptures. That what the enemy meant for evil, God means for good. It's like some really just redemptive judo move. Like some of you, you know, like martial arts where, where you, like the, your, your opponent is throwing a punch or kicking you. And what you do in those moments is you use the momentum of the enemy against them to turn it for your good. 
And this is what Paul's doing here. He's joining with the Spirit of God in him. He's changed, but he's chained, but the gospel is loose. Paul, he is restrained, but the gospel is moving. He's in prison, but the gospel is free. Acts chapter 28, verses 30 and 31 says it like this. Paul stayed two whole years in his own rented house, and he welcomed all who had visited him. Can you imagine a prisoner being hospitable? <laughs> welcomed all who visited him. And here it is, proclaiming the kingdom of God, teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Point number one this morning, if you're taking notes, the gospel moves forward despite persecution. The gospel moves forward despite persecution. What can man do to me? Do you think that society, this world, can do something that would truly impede the gospel? If the gospel is the power of God to save sinners, man, nothing's going to stop it. Persecution? Paul knew this. He, he was going to renew his mind daily and remind himself that this is an opportunity, not a setback. But Paul, he doesn't just say this. He doesn't just make this wild claim without substantiating this. He gives evidence of the gospel advancing in, in verse 13. He says it like this, so that uh, it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. The word here is the praetorium. This is this whole imperial guard. These are the young elite warriors of the day. Like th these are Caesar's Navy SEALs that he hand-selected to keep himself safe. So think about it logically. Like, man, if you're the emperor, that, that, that somebody can come and stab you in the back at any moment, literally, <laughs> like don't you want the most well-trained, the most devoted, the, the, the strongest warriors to keep you safe? These are young men that are in their, in their most vital years, peak fitness, they're in their glory days. Their testosterone levels are high. They ain't the ones playing fantasy football on the weekends. They're the ones getting in the game. Like these are, these are significant leaders. And get this, because they were in the Imperial Guard, they had everything to lose when they followed Jesus. Everything to lose when they followed Jesus. I wonder how many of us in this room today... It, we would say, man, it, it cost me something whenever I followed Jesus by faith. Or maybe you've been following Jesus for some time and you would say today, man, if I lived out my faith today, like Paul lived out his faith then, it would come with a price tag. And Paul is telling you, it is always worth it, no matter the price. Always worth it. The Praetorium, these were young elite warriors. They're kind of, uh, the, these were the leader of leaders. And it reminded me of what's going, what has been happening this past week in, uh, on the campus of Ohio State. If you haven't seen this on social media, maybe you should go look it up afterward. I've been so encouraged by the Ohio State football team that prior to their first game, they, uh, they really just had what I, I can just call a, a revival service where they just gathered together on a public, uh, public park in, on campus and they began to sing some worship songs. It wasn't a super produced service, but they began singing worship songs to Jesus and these players, one after the other, began to stand up and read scripture. They begin to stand up and share their testimony. Men that have, uh, that young men that have everything to lose, NIL money, tens of thousands of dollars on the line. They, they knew this. They knew the, the price. They knew the cost that could come with sharing their faith on their campus. They knew the ridicule. They knew what could come of it. But they still spoke all the more with boldness. Man, when men are soul, leader, soul winners, when True men of God desire nothing more than to make Jesus famous through winning souls around them. Whatever area and circle of influence that God is giving you, the enemy can't stop it. Persecution can't stop it. And it impacts everyone else. That's, what he's, that's exactly what Paul says in verse 13. Throughout the whole imperial guard, and get this, and to everyone else. 
Like Paul, he, he's not super clear here, and he doesn't give us great, uh, uh, great specificity on who could this be. I, I'm just thinking, in, uh, in, and in preparation for this message this morning, I, many different pastors and commentators said that this could involve the barracks that where these men stayed. It could be uh, their homes and their families. It could be uh, where they just uh, camped out in public. It could be government and fitch officials that they responded to or reported to. It could be a, a many different types of people, but Paul is not giving great specificity here. So it's safe to say that the gospel was multiplied in Rome. And it all started with Paul. Paul in prison sharing his faith to the people that were keeping him there. And those men sharing their faith with everyone else. And then another ripple effect happens. That Look with me in verse 14. Most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly because Paul is preaching the gospel to his guards. His, the guards are sharing the gospel with people around them. The, the other Christians in Rome that are members of the church in Rome, they're seeing this. And they have, they've been ignited some confidence. They say, you know what, if Paul can preach in prison, so can we that they began to step up into the public square and share all the more. They began preaching more and more and more. And this is a simple spiritual principle that, that you and I can take home with us today. I, I, I learned it first from the book Experiencing God. Many of you have walked through this before. And it's a simple spiritual principle, so simple that a young boy from Louisiana could get it at a young age. It's this. Ask yourself, where is God on the move? Look around. Where is God on the move? And join him. Where's God on the move? In your life. Where's God on the move? Join him. I, I can give you, uh, you can rest assured, I, I can give you confidence today that God is on the move in this church. Man, I've seen it with my own eyes for years now. Are you kidding me that we've seen uh, around 1,000 people baptize this church here? Praise God. Those are lives changed forever by the power of the gospel. This, just this week, in the past 48 hours, I've gotten to bear witness to students on Wednesday night at our dodgeball event. We sat right over there in that room, and we talked about what it meant to follow Jesus and profess their faith in Christ at the, with the Hebrew basketball team. Last night at the gathering, you saw four young adults make a decision either to be baptized or confess sin or, 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 or to move forward in a call to ministry. God is on the move in this church, and I don't know what it's going to take for us to believe it, to get it through our head, but God is on the move here, and it's time for us to step up and join him, to do whatever we can in the area of influence that we have here at this church and in this city to see God move mightily. I think that we're just one spark away. I think this church and this city are our nation. I think believe by faith. Call me, a, call me a, a blind optimist, if you will, but I believe by faith that we're a tinderbox and we're just waiting for a spark and revival is going to sweep this country. Come on. That the brothers, they, they gain confidence. You can see the ripple effect of, God's, of Paul's faithfulness. And so my question to you today is, are you walking through a trial? Are you walking through a trial? Here in just a few minutes after I, I wrap up, the first question on the screen is going to be a question of, are you walking through a trial? And because we're brothers, we're men together here at Friday Morning Men's, we're going to stop and pray for you if you say yes. You may not have to share all the nitty-gritty details, but we do not want you to leave this day if you're walking through a trial without being prayed for. And maybe, maybe you're worried about what could happen, the outcome, that you could be, that, that you're worried, like these other brothers, prior to hearing of what Paul is doing in prison, that you're scared, paralyzed with fear. And rather than thinking that you're a victim to a, a circumstance or a trial or a situation, I'm going to invite you to change your mind today. That rather than thinking that you're enchained in whatever is going on in your life, I'm going to invite you to think that God has uniquely wired you for this moment like whatever you're going through, God has uniquely wired you for this moment, not some future moment that is to come, not some past moment that you, that you reflect on often. God has made you for this moment today. Winston Churchill has a quote, says it like this, that every man has a day that for, for which they were specifically created. 
And what a tragedy would it, would it be if that day, metaphorically, tapped them on the shoulder and found them unprepared and unqualified for that which could have been their finest hour. And as a men of God, that moment is right now. It's every moment that we breathe oxygen on this earth. Our finest moment could be this moment, right here and right now. And I'm inviting you today, and I'm compelling you, that just like Paul, your courage would be contagious. That it doesn't matter your situation, that you would boldly live for Christ and live as righteous, uh, righteous as a lion, Proverbs 28, verse 1. That you would be bold and your courage would be contagious and your families, they, they would be impacted. Your workplaces would be impacted. That the lost people that you encounter on a daily basis would be forever altered because of your faith faithfulness and your courage because it is contagious. But my concern is that too many of us, we're in the back seat and we're asking God, where are we going? And are we there yet? The gospel won't be stopped by persecution and neither will it be stopped by false motives. Paul says in verse 15, to be sure, some preach Christ out of envy in rivalry, but others out of goodwill. These preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. Paul, he's expounding a little bit about the brothers mentioned in verse 14. He, he's taking these uh, Christian men who are preaching the gospel in Rome, and he's uh, dividing them up into two different categories. He says uh, these categories are based on their motivation. Some people are preaching Christ because it is, uh, it, it is truly a selfish uh, a, a selfless motivation, that they have a holy ambition to preach Christ and see him magnified. Other people, they have a selfish motivation, that they may be some spiritual opportunist, they, that they, uh, they, they may try to uh, wreak havoc upon Paul while he's in prison. He says in verse 17, causing him trouble. But these are the two categories that Paul is, is showing us today, a false, uh, or one of false motivation and one of true holy motivation. Point number two is this, that the gospel moves forward regardless of motivation. He gives us a little bit more detail in verse 16 for the first group. He says, these are the people, these are the men that preach out of love, a holy ambition that whenever we were on road trips, my dad introduced us to all the classics. Like, I, I learned, I, I learned uh, bands like Styx, uh, of course, Journey, uh, Foreigner, and then the, uh, this is a, another song that we sang often uh, was uh, by, by a band called Boston, More Than a Feeling. Like, the, I learned it. Come on, baby. Like, yeah, this is more than a feeling. And uh, whenever Paul's mentioning this idea of love here, I mean, it's more than a feeling. It's not, it's not just some temporary, like, emotional high, like, you may get whenever you go on a retreat or uh, we talk about, like, some camp high in Christianity. This is not just some emotional moment. This is a self-sacrificial commitment. I am all in no matter what. This is agape type of love. This is the type of love Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians verses, uh, chapter 13. That he says that if I speak with the tongues of angels... Yet not have love. I am the rusty gate or clanging symbol. If I can speak prophetically with all knowledge and wisdom, understanding the mysteries of God, yet have not love, I am nothing. I could even give my body up to be a martyr, martyr burned at the stake for Christ, yet not have love, it would be for nothing. These are the guys. These are the guys that understood the reason that Paul was in prison. He was, he was in prison because of Christ. He was appointed, verse 16, for the defense of the gospel. And this is why I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for our pastor. I'm grateful for our church that we've stepped into the fray in, in the area of apologetics, that we're willing to step forward and engage in significant conversations uh, around this idea of defending our faith in the public square, that we're not going to take a step back. We're moving forward with the gospel and with the truth of God's word. And so I'm going to invite you to join me at the Biblical Worldview Conference here in a few weeks. I'm super excited about it. We've got awesome speakers. You can sign up at PrestonwoodWorldview.org. If you want to have your faith uh, emboldened by uh, a, a strong defense of your faith from God's word, join us as we, uh, as we dig in 
in a few weeks. Verse 17, Paul continues, and he moves to this second category, those of selfish ambition. He says, these are the men that preach Christ out of selfish ambition. Paul here, he's not condoning this type of preaching. He's not celebrating this type of preaching. He is just clarifying that there, in fact, are, in the kingdom of God, people that preach for false motivation, for selfish means. And he rightly calls it out as sin. Specifically, two things. Envy and rivalry. Envy, very quickly, simply says, I want what you have. I I want what you have. And and maybe you can kind of see the entitlement that is undergirding envy. And it makes people green. The other one is rivalry. Rivalry, this is where a lot of men can kind of struggle. And I certainly sense this in my own heart and life. That because I'm just a, I'm just a competitive guy, like I don't have like a dial that, can, that I can crank up my competitiveness. It's a switch. It's either off or it's on. If, we, if you invite me to play pickleball, it, is, it will 100% always be on, I can promise you. That this, that this rivalry says I'm better than you. And because of a competitive spirit often leads to frustration, it, while envy makes you green, rivalry makes you red. And both are selfish. And man, I just want to tell you that these are two things that I have to crucify daily in my own life. I have to crucify these things daily. The envy of what other people have, maybe it's recognition. The envy of what other people have, maybe it's stuff. Maybe the rivalry of thinking that I, I'm better than other people. I'm trying to prove myself that I'm somehow, some, some way better than another person that's not in any type of comp- competition with me. How ludicrous is this that may, my desire to prove myself, my desire to be the best, my desire to want what other people have, it, I've got to crucify it every single day because I don't want to preach Christ from selfish ambition. I'm going to preach Christ from love. So forget all these things. Give me Jesus, love for his people, and love for his word. Because these are the two things that will last forever, his word and his people. Give me more of that. What are your motivations to share the gospel? What are your motivations to live for Christ? Do you want to be noticed? Are you trying to prove that you're more righteous than another brother around you? Are you green with envy? If so, the answer is gratitude and contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Are you red with rivalry? The answer is humility and celebration. If you can't celebrate another brother receiving a blessing from God or the credit he deserves, then you need to repent. Why, this, why do we do this? Why do we do ministry? Why do we share the gospel? We do it out of love. Because it's the only fuel that lasts. And this love, it trumps envy, it trumps rivalry, and this love, it leads us to joy. My dad was always driving on the road trips growing up. When I told, uh, whenever I got old enough, I told him in my, in my audacity to give me the wheel. And uh, I said, Dad, uh, do you even know where you're going? <laughs> like, what, what, are you, what are you doing? This is taking far too long. And he looked back and he said, son, do you want to drive? Do you think you can do better? And in, like, in, in my 14, 15-year-old self, I'm like, well, yeah, of course. That's why I'm saying this right now. Of course I think I can do better. And that's when my dad would just take the, take the knob on the volume of the radio and just kind of crank it up. And that was my subtle reminder that I need to stop talking <laughs> And man, I think, I, I think that sometimes we're, we're asking God the same thing. God, do you, do you know where you're going? Are we there yet? Or maybe, maybe we're too proud or we're so proud that we would believe that we have already arrived. And it robs us of love and it robs us of what Paul is about to show us here. Great joy. These, these false motives or these preachers motivated with false motives. They thought they could cause trouble for Paul. But Paul is undeterred. He says in verse 18, What does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Paul, he doesn't let his ego get in the way. He is resolute to rejoicing. He is unbothered, undeterred, and he is going to celebrate 
why. He says it right here, verse 18, that Christ is proclaimed. That when Jesus is lifted up, God draws all men to himself that when Christ is proclaimed, doesn't matter if it's from selfish ambition or, or, or selfless ambition, a holy ambition, that sinners are saved. Lives are redeemed, families are restored, uh, marriages are put back together, society is impacted for its good, and God gets glory. And because we do ministry and we share the gospel, despite our persecution, we do it with the motivation of love, of course Paul has joy. Like it's the natural response of seeing God move in our midst is great joy. And so point number three this morning is the gospel moves forward with joy. The gospel moves forward with joy. Paul, man, he's a walking exclamation mark. Like this dude, you can't do anything to stop him. Like he's always radiating joy. Prison, joy. In the public square, joy. It doesn't matter. He is just radiating with the joy of Christ. Why? Because he understands what God is celebrating. He understands God's scoreboard. He understands that if the gospel's preaching, being preached faithfully, praise God, God's going to use it. He understands that God is cheering for uh, uh, preachers to preach his word boldly. Praise God. People are being saved in Rome and beyond. Praise God. People are growing in maturity in Christ-likeness, taking their next steps of faith. Praise God. And if we can do this and not worry about who gets the credit, then we can have joy. What, does it gonna, what is it going to matter if you get the recognition? What's it going to matter if your name is in the headlines? What's it going to matter if someone notices you at doing something uh, that is God-honoring? Ultimately, all glory goes to Christ that we would just step back and be humble servants of him and just see his beauty on display and marvel at the grace of God who would be so kind to use us despite us for his glory. Because God is under no obligation to save. He's under no obligation to use me or use you. But by his grace, he is so kind to do it. And when he does, the natural response of every godly man is joy. It's joy. So the gospel, it moves forward despite persecution, regardless of motivation, and with joy. And so here we are today. Paul, he's finished his race. He's gotten out of the driver's seat. He's flipped the keys to you and I today. And it is our time to drive. Us who are once questioning, where are we going? And are we there yet? We're the ones that have been equipped for God for this moment. Or equipped by God for this moment. He's given you everything that you need for life and godliness. He's giving you the GPS, his word. He's giving us, uh, he's given us to be uh, his spirit, to fill us, to guide us into all truth, convict us where we go wrong, comfort us in our pain. We, we are filled with God's spirit, planted on God's word, committed to the people of God. So men, let's go. Like what's holding us back? Is it fear? Look to Paul and let his courage be contagious to you today. If, it, if it's envy, humble yourself. If it's rivalry, humble yourself and be grateful that God would even use a man like you. Let's go and let's enjoy the ride with a smile on our face because the gospel moves forward with great joy. I'm going to pray, and after I say amen, there's going to be several questions on the screen. I want to give you about 10 minutes to dive through those, and then I'm going to come up and close our time. Heavenly Father, we love you. God, we don't just say that flippantly. We do love you. We remember days in our lives where we've strayed from you, and we've been far from you. And by your redeeming love, you've reached down into our mess out of the muck and the mire of our sin. You've pulled us up, set our feet on a solid rock, making our steps secure, put a new song in our mouth, a song of praise to you. And so we give you glory, and we say thank you, Jesus. And I pray that today, through the preaching and teaching of your word, that you ignite something in me and in these men, that we would move forward with boldness and with joy to see your gospel go forward one person at a time today. So Jesus, we just commit right now to give you all the glory for what you're going to do in and through us this day. We love you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. You've got about 10 minutes for the questions on your screen, and then I'll come up to close.
All right, men. I know uh, I hate to interrupt a lot of great conversations, and certainly after I pray, you can continue those, but uh, we're going to draw our time to a close this morning with a word of prayer. And so if you're able and you'd like to, I'm going to invite you to take a knee with me, just at your chair. And Father, we do humble ourselves before you. And God, what a beautiful sight it is to see hundreds of men just bowing the knee before you, your lordship, your authority, your rule, and your reign. And we praise you that you leverage your authority on our lives for our good, that you fill us with your spirit, you strengthen us with your grace for everything that you have called us to do this day. And I pray that today we would eliminate envy, eliminate rivalry, eliminate eliminate any selfishness that would stand in our way from fully experiencing the joy of pushing the gospel forward today. Because that's what you've called us to. And so I I hope and I pray that you would help us do it this day and that you would uh, raise up men in our church that would strenuously contend with all the power that you work so mightily within us to that end. And Jesus, we just promise right now that we'll give you all the glory because you are the only one who is worthy to receive it. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. See you next Friday, men. Thanks for being here.